evening. I'm Lori Rabishaw, the Executive Director of La Grua Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's conversation. La Grua Center's mission is to engage community via arts and culture, and we do so by presenting a variety of concerts, art exhibitions, and speakers on a wide range of topics. We are now presenting those events as best we can on digital platforms like YouTube and Zoom. We usually start with a little housekeeping. I'm coming to you from La Grua's office in Stonington, and our program director, Kelly Rocherell, is behind the scenes from her home office. We welcome your questions and ask you to write them in the Q&A section on your screen, and we'll do our best to get to them after our guests have chatted. Tonight's discussion is planned to go 90 minutes, um, unlike our usual 60 minutes. Our discussion will be recorded and available on La Grua Center's YouTube channel after the Thanksgiving Day holiday. This is also the time when I take a moment to thank the many people who donate to La Grua Center's annual fund each year, and I know some of you are with us tonight. Those gifts are a very big part of making our year-round programming possible, and those annual fund dollars matter more than ever during this time of COVID when many of the usual activities are curtailed and we can't get together in person. So now on to our presentation. We are delighted to partner for the first time with the Jewish Federation of Eastern Connecticut in bringing their exhibition, Stories of Resilience, Encountering Racism to La Grua Center. I had the pleasure of being in the audience for the exhibit's opening back in February when it opened at the Lyman Allen Art Museum. This is an exhibit about stories and several of the subjects of that exhibit, Lonnie Braxton, Florence Clark, and Donetta Hodge told some of their personal stories about growing up in the Jim Crow era in our first panel discussion which is on YouTube, and we are so grateful to them. I think some of them are also in our audience tonight. We also thank another subject in the exhibit, Merle Smith and his wife, Linda, who were not able to join us for the last panel. All of these folks, their stories are in the exhibit. We are grateful to the Lyman Allen for their help in mounting the exhibit and to the Dominion Energy Charitable Foundation for their financial support. We are even more grateful to Tammy Kay, the Jewish Federation's program manager, who we work so very closely with to mount the exhibit in our space. Today's her birthday. We're glad she's with us. And to Jerry Fisher, the recently retired and longtime executive director of the Jewish Federation, who is instrumental in making the exhibit happen. In tonight's panel, we hear from different generations of Black leaders in our community about their experiences today, as well as get a little dose of 19th century history another aspect of our art exhibition, as we view their stories through an arts and culture lens, which is right in La Grua Center's wheelhouse. So tonight, we also send our deepest thanks to this evening's panelists, Curtis Goodwin, Colton Harris, Tamara Lanier, and Tom Shook, and our moderator, Gail McDonald, for their willingness to share their stories, including some that I imagine may not be that all, all that easy to retell. As our country goes through a renewed emphasis on how we might overcome racism, there's a noteworthy quote by the author James Baldwin that surely can help guide us. He says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. That's a reminder that in order for us to change the future, we must continue to face our history, both long past and still current. And that's where our conversation will begin tonight. So I now pass it off to Jerry, who's going to tell us a little bit about how this whole particular project came about, and he'll introduce our moderator. Welcome, Jerry. Please take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank the La Grua Center for allowing us to extend this exhibit. We were um, very excited when it opened at the Lyman Allen, and then we were hit with COVID, and we were crushed with the idea that the exhibit would not be seen. So we now have a new home at the La Grua, and it's available for you to see every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 10 to 2. And we plan to remount the exhibit at Connecticut College as soon as the campus can open to the public. I want to thank the Palmer Fund and the Bodenwein Fund, who have been instrumental in both of our encountering programs at the Jewish Federation and providing support to mount this exhibit. Um, these ex this exhibit and an upcoming exhibit on Holocaust survivors came about because we felt that history did have to be faced. Uh, 12 to 15 years ago, Holocaust denial seemed to be gaining traction in America. And we had many survivors living in our community who were very distressed about it. 
So we started the Holocaust Resource Center and started a program called Encountering Survivors, where students met with Holocaust survivors in small group settings in their homes. A several years ago, five or six years ago, New London High School athletic teams were encountering racial taunts when they visited high schools in the region. We weren't satisfied with the response uh, to those incidents, and we felt that we had the structure with encountering survivors to mount a similar program called Encountering Differences. And we started that program. Tammy Kay is now the coordinator of both of those programs, Encountering Survivors and Encountering Differences. And we recruited African Americans as we had in, recruited Holocaust survivors and then the children of survivors to tell their stories to students as they came into their homes. Um, in a way, this second symposium is bringing it down a generation, just as we had to bring it down a generation with the Holocaust survivors. So when we heard from Lonnie and Donetta and Florence and Merle Smith, we were hearing from a generation that endured segregation and endured Jim Crow and saw cross burnings. Tonight, we're gonna to be hearing from the next generation down about what they've encountered in their lives. I'm very appreciative to Gail Bracci de Ferro de McDonald. She is a professor in journalism at the University of Connecticut and a veteran journalist and author of local history books. She was a re reporter for the day and her work has appeared in the Times, the Hartford Current, the Rhode Island Monthly, Vermont Life, and the Jerusalem Report, as well as many other magazines and newspapers. She's won numerous journalist awards and her two books, Hidden History of Mystic and Stonington and Morton F. Plant and the Connecticut Shoreline Philanthropy in the Gilded Age are substantial and important books. She lives in New London with her husband and my friend Bruce McDonald. And it's my pleasure to hand it over to Gail now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jerry. And thank you to the uh, LaGrua Center. I'm honored to serve as the moderator of tonight's panel. And this is a very important uh, continuation of conversation of, around racism that we know still exists, unfortunately. So I, am, I have the honor of, of introducing our four panelists, uh, three of whom are going to speak more about current issues, and one is going to give us a, a historic perspective of, um, of, of some issues in New London. So first I'm going to introduce uh, Curtis Goodwin. Uh, Curtis was born and raised in New London and graduated from New London High School. He is currently a city councilor for, uh, in the city of New London, and he chairs the Council Committee for Economic Development Goodwin championed police accountability, the proposed development of a state-of-the-art community rec center, and has helped develop a new black history walking marker tour, an urban park initiative, and many other initiatives within the city of New London as a freshman counselor. Uh, professionally, Goodwin is an emerging, emerging thought leader in the marketing and media sector. So welcome, Curtis. Um, Next, I'm gonna introduce uh, Colton Harris. And Colton is an artist, musician, director, facilitator, and creative visionary. Uh, he's from Groton. He's worked as an arts administrative leader in various capacities for several years, developing arts integration curriculum focused on social justice and youth development. And as a creative director, he's directed new works of theater, interdisciplinary events and community-based programming. He's currently serving as an arts program associate at the Connecticut Office of the Arts. So welcome Colton. Uh, the next uh, panelist is Tamara Lanier. And Tamara is a tireless champion for truth and justice where her advocacy has taken her to many parts of the state, country and the world. 
She is a 27 year veteran of the state of Connecticut judicial branch who retired in 2017 as the chief probation officer or as a chief probation officer in the Norwich probation office. In May 2015, she was named Woman of the Year by the Connecticut General Assembly's Commission on Afro-American Affairs. Lanier has several passions, one of which is to eradicate racial and ethnic disparities in Connecticut's criminal justice system. So welcome to Mara. And finally, uh, we have uh, our fourth panelist is Tom Shook. Uh, Tom is a New London native, a graduate of Georgetown University in Washington, DC, with a longstanding interest in social justice issues. He retired after 38 years as executive director of a local residential facility for troubled adolescent males. He has an avid his interest in history, particularly John Brown and the Civil War, but as a lifelong Sherlock Holmes fan, his area of special interest has become unknown, hidden, forgotten, or suppressed local history. This interest is what led him to the discovery of a number of previously unknown or forgotten stories of New London history, one of which he's going to share with us now. And that is the story of, um, of Ichabod Pease, who is featured in the exhibition that is now at the LaGrua Center. Um, so Tom, could you briefly tell us about Ichabod Pease's story? Thank you, Gail. Uh, yes, I'd be delighted to. And I'm, I'm delighted to be able to participate in this. And thank you to Jerry and the uh, LaGrua Center for this. Uh, the Ichabod Pease story is a story of strength, determination, and resilience in the face of racism and oppression in a different time, but it remains relevant as an inspiration for the struggle that we are engaged in today. Ichabod Pease was born into slavery in 1755 on Fisher's Island. He spent the first 39 years of his life enslaved in New London, including two years spent living as a fugitive when his slaveholder, Robinson Munford, in 1979 tried to take him south and away from his wife during the American Revolution. He was finally captured again on, in 1781, and he was sold as property to settle the debt of the absconding Munford. He was re-enslaved in 1783, and he was finally en emancipated in 1794 by Captain John Deshawn. After this, Ichabod Pease and his wife Rose lived quietly in New London until her death in 1808. They had no children. They were devout parishioners at St. James Church where he was highly esteemed by all. And he worked as a gardener for General Jedediah Huntington who was on George Washington's staff at the Mount Vernon house on Huntington Street which is where Tony Dees is today. And he was said to resemble the general in manners and character. Well, in the 1830s, the entire nation, including New London, was embroiled in a controversy over the growing abolition movement and the education of people of color. Towns, churches, and even families were divided, often heatedly, on the subject. In 1837, New London was strongly anti-abolitionist, and the New London School Society was vexed over what to do about the growing resentment against black children in classrooms with white students. That's the exact moment when this great good man, Ichabod Pease, stepped forward with a proposal. He offered to start a school for black children and he would operate it out of his home on Church Street, which is now Governor Winthrop Boulevard. Pease understood the importance of education and he was 81 years old at the time. Not many 81 year olds are starting a new career teaching children. His initial proposal was uh, rejected by the New London School Society, but he was persistent. He went back a second time, and this time they accepted their proposal, and he was awarded $50 a year to operate his school for two years. And then over time, the Black children were then assimilated into the regular New London school system. But he had provided a solution to the crisis for New London on behalf of New London's Black children. Ichabod Pease is a story of how one man was able to use his personal qualities of strength, determination, and resilience while maintaining his dignity, piety, and goodness in behalf of the children of his oppressed race. And he did so in the face of strong racist opposition in the midst of a national controversy over abolition and education and in spite of his advanced age. 
This is the stuff of heroes. Ichabod Pease died on March 3rd, 1842 at age 86. At his funeral, quote, the most eminent citizens sought the privilege of acting as bearers at his funeral. His eulogy, which is published, is called The Dignity of Goodness. It was given by Reverend Robert Hallam, and it reads in part, we doubtless all feel that this was a remarkable man, the more remarkable because his distinction was of an uncommon sort and lay purely in eminence of goodness. All who beheld him knew that they looked upon a good man and felt how awful goodness is and bowed before it with involuntary reverence. He sought no praise, he courted no attentions, he walked quietly in his own appointed sphere with a modest unconsciousness of his own superiority, intent only on being faithful and, quote, doing his duty in that state of life into which it had pleased God to call him. He deserves to be commemorated. So what do we have to commemorate Mr. Ichabod Pease? Well, we have his eulogy, which by the way is available online and it's also available through Amazon for about 10 bucks. It's called The Dignity of Goodness. We have his gravestone in New London, which thanks to a fundraiser last year by the New London Landmarks has been restored. And thanks to Jerry Fisher and the Jewish Federation and the LaGrua Center, we're able to share his remarkable story in this exhibit in the Stories of Resilience right here at the LaGrua Center. And thanks to the inspired and energetic leadership of New London City Councilor Curtis Goodwin, we will very soon be installing a plaque on the historic site of Ichabod Pease School for Black Children in New London. So we are pleased to honor this great good man, Ichabod Pease, who rose from a condition of abject slavery, achieved an education and his emancipation, and who stood up on behalf of the children of his community, and in doing so, earned the love and respect of people of all races. He remains an inspiration to us today, as we too face a divided country and struggle as he did with issues of equity and justice. Ichabod Pease is an authentic New London and American hero. And thanks to you, Councillor Goodwin, he will, we will not let him be a forgotten one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. So that's a, a fascinating story. And as uh, we all know, it's really important for us to understand our history, um, to better understand some of the contemporary issues that we're still dealing with. So thank you very much. I'm going to direct this next question to um, Tamara. And Tamara, you've had a, a career in the judicial system, and we're hoping that you can reflect on how you experienced racism within your workplace and how you saw it within the criminal justice system from policing to the judicial process to sentencing, perhaps. Great. Well, Thank you um, for that question and thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this discussion. Um, and as was stated earlier, I um, am a 27 year veteran of the Connecticut Judicial Branch. Um, I retired, uh, it's been three years now, um, but initially when I started working, I, um, I uh, started working in Willimantic and shortly thereafter I transferred to the Norwich uh, court system into the Norwich Probation Office. And um, when I talk about the racism as it relates to the population we service, it's not much different than the types of microaggressions and discrimination that I saw amongst my coworkers and peers throughout the branch across the state. Um, in the late 80s, early 90s, when I arrived, there was a judge, I think it was Justice Peters, who had um, recently initiated uh, or commissioned a committee to study uh, the, the allegations of discrimination in the branch by not only people who were employed there, but people who were the receive, receivers of the service. And the report was overwhelmingly negative, pointing to discrimination, disparate treatment, um, excessive scrutiny, and other types of microaggressions. But there was a committee that was put together to look at this statewide and to come up with recommendations as to how to alleviate these issues. And I was fortunate enough to get on that committee. And um, we worked, it was called the Affirmative Action Committee. And, um, what we did was we were 
not only making recommendations based on personal experiences, we participated, we created surveys and disseminated surveys. Um, and there was at that point um, a real hope that um, the work we were doing would be um, reformative, that it would make inroads. But as we labored, one of the things that the people of color on this committee um, were starting to say amongst themselves is, you know, we're doing this work, but we don't see or hear that there's any meaningful change going on. And so the issues that um, I saw at that point when I speak about microaggressions and um, disparate treatment, it was primarily um, focused on men of color, black or Hispanic men. And what you would see is that um, certain things that other people did would be a major employment issue um, resulting in an adverse employment action for people of color, particularly black men and Hispanic men when the same actions were, um, when the same conduct was um, prevalent with non-minorities, we saw that there were no real disciplines and that how people were held to a higher and different standard. Um, and so that persisted. Um, we saw people being fired for things that other people didn't um, even get disciplined for. And uh, I wanna say maybe 10 or so years into my career, um, I, had, I had a responsibility at the court and one of the first volunteers that I worked with was Miss Jackie Owens, who was my first volunteer at the court. And she was also at that time, the president of the NAACP. And so what, when I was assigned to the court, what I started to see is the same kind of disparate treatment, um, the excessive discipline, and the obvious disparities falling along racial lines and not only in how they are treated in court, but also in their dispositions. And when I say treated, um, oftentimes I would hear from people that they felt disrespected, that they didn't feel valued. Um, I, I recall conversations, Mrs. Owens would um, monitor the docket for me and I recall conversations where she would say, sometimes I feel like slavery hasn't ended. And she would actually sit in court and hear how cases were presented and, 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 and witness the kind of disparate treatment um, that people uh, were, th that the defendants were receiving as they went before the judge. And so um, based on our conversations, that's when I actually joined the NAACP and I started uh, working outside of the branch to make a difference. I can say the other thing that I got involved with at, at a latter point in my career that I regret that it took me so long to get involved with was the union. And one of the things that I was pressing the union to do because everyone was seeing the disparate discipline, people being terminated um, people of color being terminated for things that non-minorities didn't get disciplined for and why the union was not calling that as they saw it. So we started asking the union for data based on discipline and along racial lines. And when they finally put that report together, it, it revealed exactly what we had been seeing for years. So in the latter part of my career, I started working on using data to demonstrate what we were seeing that no one would listen to when we would talk about discrimination and disparate treatment. Well, that's uh, powerful stuff, certainly. And um, uh, we're gonna turn to uh, Curtis now uh, with another question, but um, uh, you know, certainly any of our panelists can also kind of weigh in on previous questions as well. But, let me throw this one out to you, Curtis, and, uh, and uh, you can uh, go from there. So it's been about a decade uh, since Matthew Chu was uh, tragically murdered in New London. Uh, six uh, African-American teenagers were charged in his death and the city mobilized to try and prevent a uh, racist backlash to the murder. You were a key person in that effort. 
Can you describe the atmosphere in New London at the time and some of what you did to try to try to heal the city? Well, it's, it's actually kind of eerie thinking about it. You know, uh, I see some similarities now in present day with the Black Lives Matter movement and the turmoil and the unrest there. Um, and I can definitely associate it with the feelings of of, of feeling under undervalued and, and unwelcomed in my own city when that tragic murder happened. I mean, the key words are six African-American teenagers. Um, so when you state that the city mobilized, um, kind of have to have a little bit of a correction there. The city was reactive in its efforts. And I think that's a key takeaway for me and the work that I do championing being a counselor now. Um, back then I, I looked around and I didn't see adults that were able to you know, be proactive in, in handling a diverse community. So in doing so, we, you know, we formed this New London Talent Show to make sure that one, we acted in a very intentional way but we showcase beautiful black and brown children on the God art stage to say, you know, these are not bored thugs. One of the one of the biggest regrets that I hope you know the media takes away from this and the city is is painting people of color or youth or anyone with a broad brush that we're all the same. So when they when they printed six black bored thugs murdered a white teen, you can only imagine what that did for not only myself but any person of color that's in, the, in a city as diverse, but that's led by people that do not reflect them. Um, so in doing so, we decided to start a talent show that's been going on for over a decade now. Um, and just building bridges, being very intentional in the way we do that. We partnered with the, the police station, um, with Chief Reichard there to make sure that they provided uh, food to the students, to the youth that participate in it. And in doing so, it helped to form a relationship that goes beyond the interactions that you would experience on the street with a police officer. You know, when you bring food or break bread with someone, it gives you a very meaningful way to interact with them. We also use the talent show as a, a platform for mentoring to make sure that we bring guidance and, and mentorship to the acts that are in there because they get to go out and be pillars in their community. And the, the idea, the overall idea of the talent show is planting seeds. You know, we plant so many of these different seeds, you have no idea when the timing is right, um, when the sunshine is bright enough that these seeds will hatch into beautiful plants that can spur opportunity, spur progression and, and build bridges in their, in, in their community. Um, so that's kind of what I decided to do in my take on how I would respond to the tragic event, um, which ultimately ended in the loss of Matthew Chu. So Curtis, what's happening with the talent show during COVID? Are you still able to go on in some fashion? Well, COVID prevented a uh, presented a lot of challenges. Uh, we just wrapped up season 10, um, which we streamed virtually in the midst of uh, uh Starting season 10, we were actually planning for what should have been a sold out show at the Guard Art Center, but unfortunately, uh, COVID stopped that. But we learned a lot during COVID, and it's how resilient we should be, how resilient we are, and the beacon of hope and light that we provide for the community. I was able to position the talent show um, in a way so that it came before elections and in between so much unrest in the community as a way to show the community that one, we're still here, we're still relevant, but, but two, that you know, we have to spur unity, even when we're making these tough decisions as voting for politics, et cetera. Um, we have to come together and have these uh, great dialogues and conversation. So uh, great question, and we were able to stream that. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna turn now to, uh, to Colton. And Colton, you have a really interesting personal history. Uh, can you share with us some of your family history and how you and your family came to Eastern Connecticut? Uh, how did your family's church work to lead lead to your career as an activist and actor? Yeah, definitely. We're really great, grateful to be here in this space. And so a little bit about my family history. My parents are both from the South and you know, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather was raising and cultivating a family with my grandmother in Memphis, Tennessee, and they moved to Boston and around the same time, but more what felt like divine providence, my mother's family in Alabama, Montgomery, moving up north to Massachusetts as well, all about, you know, starting a new life and building and, and creating something new. And 
in their respective households, they were both raised in both creative environments, and but also environments that were focused on equity and justice. My grandfather, my paternal grandfather, who I spoke of, whose um, middle name my middle name is his is his first name and he passed a few years ago but a civil rights activist and organizer he was a black panther and and a big reason why he moved up north was to figure out ways to make a better life for his family and during that time he found faith in christ and that sort of led him to really shifting his whole life course and in that process our family is really root, rooted and steeped in in the Christian faith and seeing the ways in which we can impact and socially restore the world through these principles and through this reality of Jesus. And that's really what anchors all of the work that my family does. And, and that was what really brought us to Connecticut is my grandfather had started an extension of the church plant that was in Boston. And my, my parents were commissioned to be leaders of that church and my father is a uh, bivocational so he's a pastor but he's also a community activist works in public health and so i always saw a marriage of community activism and cultural work with our faith great thank you so much colton so to all the panelists now um you know we're reflecting on racism today obviously but uh, I, I would like you to now to discuss more recent experiences and how they reflect the racially motivated problems we are facing now. So first of all, this question for Curtis. I, I think our society seems to be striving towards uh, eliminating racism in our culture, or at least uh, trying. Uh, children's TV shows, books, and curriculums have become more multiracial and multicultural which is a great thing. Uh, for grownups, however, there seems to still be a wall of discrimination that, that um, is tough for Blacks to break through. Uh, what work are you doing to help some of our major corporations achieve a more diverse and welcoming workplace? Right, such a loaded but great question. <laughs> Um, there's just so much there. I think the first thing I'll have to pay uh, point attention to or direct your attention to is there's absolutely not enough imagery of black and brown children, of adults, of leaders, of, of community activists uh, printed in the media, printed in children TV shows, books, curriculums. So I want to make sure while I have this platform that I'm very direct in saying so that we got to set the bar much, much higher if we want to reflect the communities in which we serve. Um, to the work that I do in this space is just that, you know, challenging major corporations each and every day. For the for the past six years, I've been building a DI and E advertising uh, department in corporate America. And for those of you guys who may be unfamiliar with DI and E, that's diversity, inclusion, and um, equity. Um, and within this department, I go talk to the head HR recruiters and and the top department heads at Facebook, Google, Electric, Bo. Uh, Pfizer, you name it, all global companies, Fortune 500 companies from top to bar to bottom, knocking on their doors before uh, uh, Black Lives Matters came and this was a, a trend for corporate America to, to, to embark on, you know, inclusifying their, their workforce, you know, knocking on their doors and asking them truly, um, you, you know, letting them know that they're missing out by not diversifying their work workforce, not having thought leaders that are women, that are Black, you know, having a more diverse workforce and data and research shows to the progression that ultimately impacts the bottom line of, of these workforces. The, the issues that I face in corporate America is no one wants to spend the money to attract a diverse uh, uh, workforce. It's much easier to simply put out an Indeed ad and just say, well, that was the best talent I could get. But if you have to sit and look at your workforce in your meetings, whether they're Zoom or in person, and you don't see an inclusive workforce, you have to ask yourself, where did you fail? And those are the tough conversations that I have every single day um, with corporate America. And they've led to um, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of minorities being hired. I represent the National Society of Black Engineers, the Society of Women Engineers, uh, SOCNIS, 
um, uh, his Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, Black Teachers Association, all these major associations working with them, one, to raise the bar higher, and two, to tell corporate America from top to bottom that you have to echo that from your CEO to the Black worker that's, you know, working in a diversity and inclusion title um, that's there to, you know, open the door or separate the barriers for Black people. But we have to be a little bit more intentional in doing so. Um, and that's kind of what I get to do in corporate America. So I, I enjoy it. It's been six years of doing this and I'm really proud of the partnerships and, and what we've been able to do since starting this. Great, uh, very important work certainly. And uh, it's interesting as I, I went to a program about a year ago in New London that the NAACP of New London put on about sort of the history and uh, of the organization. And one of the things that Gene Jordan had spoken about was historically how some of the black leaders in the city did probably not in as systemic a way as you're doing it, but the same kind of thing, going to Electric Boat and other companies and you know, instilling on them the importance of, of hiring diverse workforce. Yeah. Right. I think I think the the first question because everyone agrees, you know, we want to hire more minorities. That's a that that's that's not the elephant in the room. It, it's more of the conversation on how are we going to do it and are we going to put the resources intentionally behind doing that? And those are the only conversations that I'm willing to have. Um, I'm not the typical advertising guy that's, you know, just taking any call or, or banging on the doors. No, it's very intentional. Um, hey, Google. Hey, Facebook, would you like to work with me and diversify your audience? And would you like to do it in a very meaningful and impactful way where we can, you know, where this translates into results that affect your bottom line? Um, and those are the conversations that I'm having with them. Um, so to your point, yeah, it's something that we have to do on a local level, but we also have to scale it so that when our kids leave the school system, they, there's a pipeline for them that leads beyond the judicial system. Um, there's amazing companies and corporations that are looking to hire black and brown children. We just need to bridge those gaps so that they know and on the local level, make sure that we echo that upwards. And in corporate America, me banging on the door saying they need to echo that from top to bottom. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Curtis. Um, so the next question I have is actually directed to Tamara. Um, you're involved in a significant lawsuit that maybe some of our audience has, uh, has read about against Harvard University involving two well-known civil rights attorneys. Can you tell us a little bit about that case and how it originated and where it stands right now? Sure. Um... I don't know. I don't know if you can see this image or not. I think uh, it has a reflection, but yeah. that is an image of my Papa Renti. And um, this story um, is a, a case that has been told for approximately 200 years. It's an oral history that was passed down from the man in that image to where I sit today and beyond me actually to my children. And so the Lanier versus Harvard case is about um, this man's history, this man's legacy. And it's about, it raises the question of reparations, of expropriation, of repatriation. And it also speaks to cultural appropriation in that in, I guess I should tell you a little more about my case, but my case involves a very tangled story um, with Harvard University. And based on my oral history, I was able to trace my lineage back to this man in the image um, and not only trace it back based on oral history, but it was also with death records, census records, um, probate records slave indexes. And to be honest, it's a challenge that many people of color face because of the circumstances of their ancestors and their enslavement. There isn't the documentation that is necessary to successfully trace your ancestors back to Africa. But I was able to do that because of an oral history. And then when I found this information, and I found that these were iconic images that had been seen and used throughout the world. I reached out to Harvard and I said, I, I think I have an amazing story here. I know who this man is. 
I have his oral history. I know his legacy. I know where his children were and where his children lived and where they migrated. And I said to Harvard, particularly President Drew Falls, please look at my research and confirm with me that you agree that I'm this man's granddaughter. And then in the, in, and I also asked them to stop um, sharing the very ugly narrative that was perpetrated by a Harvard scientist when he created these images, Louis Agassiz. I said, because, uh, and I asked them to, the, to do that because it was firstly false. And secondly, um, it was an ugly racist principle that was used to perpetrate slavery in the United States and disenfranchise people all over the world. But Harvard refused and they continued to promote um, a false narrative about who Rinty was and actually saying they don't know who he was. And um, after years of wrestling with Harvard over this issue and trying to get him, get them to stop denying this man's legacy, I was blessed with an opportunity to sit with attorney Ben Crump and share my story. He thought it was a landmark in the sense that these are probably one of only two slaves in the history of this country that can directly link themselves to property that has value. Um, and um, again, about the repatriation issues that it led to and also the cultural appropriation issues. So he thought it was an amazing case. He connected with a local attorney here in Connecticut, attorney Mike Koskoff, who is also uh, an attorney that uh, represents the, the David the David and the David and Goliath type cases. Um, so they partnered and they filed an amazing brief with the Middlesex uh, County Superior Court in Massachusetts. And um, as it stands now, um, it's the first time that a slave would be seeking legal redress in an American court. And it is also the first time that slaves will be arguing property rights under the 13th and 14th Amendment. So it's unique in many ways. And uh, it all started with an oral history and elders and ancestors who passed that story down generationally. And then I look back and make this discovery. Wow. Wow. So uh, do you know, have you gotten a sense of whether uh, Harvard students uh, are getting motivated by this or are they getting behind you or what's your feedback from them? They're amazing. And actually, um, they are more engaged than the attorneys. I mean, they, the Harvard students keep me very busy. And it started because one student was doing a research project. on, um, And she was uh, affiliated with the Peabody Museum. But at any rate, she stumbled on the story. She redirected her whole project and made it about this case. And wow. at the end of her session, she had to present and at the end of the semester, she had to present her project. And she said, after presenting, 65 people came to her and asked, what can we do to help? We have to mobilize and help this woman secure these images. And that started the, that started the Harvard Coalition to Free Renty. And wow. uh, since then, all the student clubs have signed on. And uh, about two months ago, the student body voted to condemn the university. For their, um, for their treatment of Rinty and for their refusal to um, return the images to his linear descendants. So they've been wonderful. Wow, that's great. Well, as somebody who works with students, um, you know, they can be very, very powerful when they get behind something. So that's, that's great. Yes. Thank you, Tamara. Um, I'm gonna direct this next question to, uh, to Colton. Uh, Colton, you went to a private high school and college here in Eastern Connecticut. Uh, can you reflect a bit on that experience and perhaps suggest actions uh, which, which might have improved your experience? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm grateful for the education that I received. There was a lot of tools, a lot of community and opportunities for me to grow as a person. Simultaneously, I'm also able to reconcile that with the fact that it was an oppressive circumstance and situation and environment. And a lot of that was cultivated by the narrow focus of the subject matters in which we were learning and in the ways in which 
we were being fed even on a subconscious level and non-directly a lot of white supremacist sort of teaching and that really inhibited me from experiencing the full expression of myself as well as being able to make really deep connections with the student body who often felt comfortable making a lot of explicitly racist comments uh, feeding into a lot of biases and stereotypes so I believe that life is sometimes lived in those tension points and that was one of those tension points and I think that some of the suggestions that I would have fed those experiences is really to create space for uh, black and brown youth to be able to grow, create, express, but also heal together. I think that there, some of what was alluded to as well is that the faculty was not reflective of the experiences. I mean, the curriculum was very narrow in a lot of ways. And I think that when we think about education and we think about institutions and systems that have power and influence, a lot of times they are stuck in the molds of tradition and tradition becomes supreme. And sometimes tradition will be upheld to the point of the eradication of real humanity that's happening in front. And I know that during my time, especially in one particular institution, when there were community conversations around diversifying the community in the school, there was a lot of pushback because classism also became a part of it as well. And so I think that equity and access to these spaces is important, but also I struggle at times with higher education or just with institutions of education in general, the mentality that students and young people come ignorant and they are there to learn and they're not necessarily valued as members of the community who can also enhance the, the school and enhance the space. So uh, that's my short answer to that question. So what, how do you think your experience, your, ed, your own personal educational experience might have been different or what it might have meant to you differently if you had attended, for example, an all black high school or historically black college or university? Yeah, I think, I think in one sense, I mean, I'm grateful that I attended predominantly white institutions because it gave me the language and the bandwidth to understand how a lot of the world that I experience now functions. It gave me some insider knowledge and information, and I definitely was a step ahead of a lot of my friends who did not have that experience. And so now they're kind of navigating and trying to wrestle with the world where I, I was exposed to the systemic and also social racism at an early age, but I also learned how to, to learn the language and code switch and navigate the, these different platforms. However, during that time, I also felt like everything that was being thrown at me was teaching me that my blackness was not just an evil, but it was insufficient. So I think that going to a all black institution would have exposed me a lot earlier to heroes that I hold today. I mean, we started off with a James Baldwin quote. I didn't read James Baldwin until I've read him on my own in college because a friend of mine gave me his book. It wasn't in my curriculum. I wasn't exposed to voices and faces that reflected my experiences, but also spoke to my gifts, my abilities, my talents and my purpose. And so I feel like what would have been great of being in those spaces was to have had probably curriculum that would have supported my identity. But also I think the friendships and the solidarity with other black and brown youth would have been really encouraging and strengthening, but I would never take back my experience. I'm grateful for where I went and it because it opened up a lot of doors for me because I mean, we live in America, there's a lot of systems and there's a lot of games you gotta play. And so I do have a couple of stamps of approval that help me get in the spaces that I'm grateful for. Thanks. Curtis, did you wanna weigh in yeah, on Yeah, I that? just wanted to interject to say, Colton, thank you for being so honest with that, that response because I think it's important um, to note a lot of the different things that you said. Um, your lived experience was different. So you chose w William School and you're grateful for that because the education and the communication tools are, are second to none. Whereas I chose not to go to Williams School. Um, I got a free ride, a free scholarship offered to me and I spent about a month there. My first encounter at some of these different private schools or private institutions were, you know, you're the token black guy. As soon as you walk in the door, you know, they said, wow, you guys are here. And it's kind of like you guys. Um, it, it, 
and I bring this up to say, how in 2020 are we still having these conversations when Ruby Bridges, who was still alive, you know, was fighting for equity and to be in these spaces and in, the, in these school systems. And here we are trying to take these pathways that truly change the trajectory or the barriers that are going to be placed in front of us, you know, whereas going to a predominantly white institution um, has more value than it does if you went to a public school system, whereas going to a, a college like uh, uh, going to a prestigious college uh, without naming all these different ones versus going to an HBCU has different value to it. When at the end of the day, these are willing and able bodies that happen to be separated by colors. And in 2020, we still have those issues and we need to address them so that we have fair equity and the pathway for students is not based on the color of your skin, nor is it based on an HBCU or a higher uh, education institution that has more privilege. It shouldn't warrant you those checks or you know those different balances that come with it. It, it. That conversation has to be at the forefront today. So Colton, thank you for your honesty in that in that answer. Yeah, you know, and thank, thank, yeah. thank you for your feedback. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, it's, it starts to get the dance around value and value language and the ways in which this means more to you, right? Because I had those experiences in high school uh, where I, you know, out in public, people would ask me, you know, usually uh, white folks, I would open up the door for them or something like that. And they're like, oh, like, you're nice. Like, you're different. When, once I told them what school I went to, like, oh, do you go to such and such school? I'm like, well, actually, no, I go here. It's like, wow. Oh, whoa, okay, cool. Like, I suddenly was valid in their eyes. Um, but when I was at school, yeah, I was, I was a one of the, one of two tokens and we would often get get confused. And like I said, the, the microaggressions, but also just the outright verbal attacks from classmates and schoolmates was was real. And, and when I would bring stuff to teachers, I mean, what are they going to do, right? They, they didn't feel equipped to, for my presence there. They weren't prepared for me anyway. Well, thank you both for that. So we're going to, we're going to move into um, sort of the third, and I think this is a, the final section of, of questions. And we all know that we've been through four very difficult years, um, but as we prepare for a new administration, we know that there's still a lot of work to do. Obviously, from hearing from you tonight, we, we know the work ahead, uh, but our new administration will include the first uh, African-American South Asian woman vice president and uh, who also was a, a graduate of, of a HBCU and also our oldest president to ever assume the office. Um, and please reflect from your particular vantage point on how we, we may move forward here. Um, to Colton uh, specifically, and, and anybody can, can jump in here too to, to move forward uh, with this. Now let's, let's leave it there and let's, uh, let's hear from you a little bit, uh, any, any of the our three panelists to to talk about how we're going to move forward in these these next four years. All right, I'll, I'll jump first, Colton. Um, so the biggest thing is that we as American as a citizens, regardless of your age, your color, have to understand that voting is a right. It's a privilege. It's anything you want to call it, but it doesn't stop there. We have to be accountable to show up and follow up and hold these folks accountable. Um, I am very grateful of the imagery of having Kamala as our vice president, a black woman, a biracial woman, a female finally in, in a place of, of, of power and influence. But at the end of the day, her track record speaks for itself. And if we don't hold our own accountable, if we don't hold politicians accountable, we're gonna get more of the same. And I, I think now is the time to wake up and to educate younger generations on the importance of not just voting, of being accountable for the follow-up that comes after voting. Yeah, and I just would like to dive in real quick as well. I think that, I mean, Malcolm X, a lot of the times people reference when he talks about symbolic victories. I think that I've heard a lot of conversation from a lot of different people who think that who our president or vice president is changes everything magically or that that's the that's the work or even that having conversations or panels is doing the work that's not the work the way forward is to look at policies to look at culture to change up work culture to switch up the environments and 
to really make some goals and some tangible commitments. And a lot of that is self-work. Individuals, in order to, be, to go on this journey, you have to commit to yourself first identifying any sort of hints of racism or bias in you. And then you have to make a commitment to really excavate those things out and going on a personal journey. So I think a lot of people are anxious and ready to change institutions, but institutions are, are ran by people. So if people, you have to have an ideological shift to say, this is, this is what kind of future I want to see without a vision, right? You can't, um, as a scripture I live by, it's like you said, without a vision, the people perish, right? This idea that you die without vision. And if you don't have a vision of where you're going, then, then you'll die in your soul, but you also your people will continue to die. So I think that to, to your point, it's about civic engagement, but it's also about helping bring deeper levels of education. We need to see education reform, what's being taught in schools, what's being put in the homes, right? And building authentic relationships and changing language, right? Because even the fact that we refer to black and brown people as the minorities is misleading, right? We're not actually the minorities. You could argue there's probably more people of color in the world than any, than any, right? We're just an oppressed people and have been um, marginalized or minoritized or underrepresented, but there's plenty of us here. And when you look at the projections and very near in the future, this whole world's going to look like us. So what are we going to do, right? So before, before I ask uh, Tamara to weigh in here, I just wanted to ask uh, Colton, in addition, as somebody who's been heavily involved in the arts and promotion of the arts and, and working in the arts, uh, what role do you see the arts playing in all of this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll quickly say that there's a quote by someone anonymous, but it says, um, give me the songs of a nation. I don't care who writes its laws. I think that art is actually central and pivotal. And the more we remove art from the equation, the more dehumanized this conversation becomes. Art is what heals people. Art is what unifies people. And every message that you've ever really gotten has not come through a news report. Art has spoken to you. I can guarantee every person on the planet can agree, which is why music artists or bands or, um, or dancers can travel all around the world and it speaks and resonates with people, which is why some of the greatest political messages have ever have ever come. They've been embedded in pieces of art, right? Whether it be theater or music. So I think art is really central. And if we continue to marginalize even the arts as just entertainment, we're missing out. Like, I'm sorry, most of what I learned was not from my educators teaching or talking at me. I learned a lot of things through art. I learned it in a movie, right? Before I took a major history test, I watched the movie version and I got an A. <laughs> you know, it's like, I mean, it helped me. It was better than that textbook. So I think that we have to keep art central to this whole experience. Thanks. So tomorrow I want to, I want to let you weigh in on this uh, too, but um, also in light of your career, if you could uh, also bring into this and, and uh, recent police violence that we've seen and how that's mobilized people nationwide, um, what are you thinking uh, as we move forward uh, to, to be able to avoid more uh, violence and killings in the future? Firstly, you know, one of the things that I wanted to share is before we think about moving forward, we have to look at where we are. And one of the major concerns for me is wellness and, 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 um, and, and self-care and mental health. Um, I can tell you personally, um, this year has been a difficult year for not only me, but many people that I know, particularly people of COVID color, after, you know, with the impact of COVID, um, the, the toxic political climate we live in, um, you know, just as an NAACP representative, I talked to someone today who was sharing with me that they were run off the road, um, uh, off a highway road, um, and they felt that it was racially motivated. So people of color particularly are in a bad space right now. And I, I know one thing that I encourage people is to recognize your, where you are and to protect your mental health. And, and so um, with that being said, and starting in that space, um, one of the things that um, I hope people take time to be more engaged with and more aware of is the Justice for George Floyd um, act that is currently um, a, a house bill and it, it promotes a lot of what 
not only we've talked about and have worked on locally, but it makes um, federal mandates for some things that I think would help communities locally. And, and when I say that, the, the whole issue and the battle we had with qualified immunity, um, the Justice for George Floyd Act will resolve that. It will make it a federal law. Um, you know, the, the concern about the escalation, um, the legislation would require that officers are charged to, before they go in with lethal, lethal force, that they have done everything humanly possible to deescalate that situation before they engage with a firearm or another type of lethal force. And I know that um, uh, through my work with attorney Crump on the, the, the Lanier versus Harvard matter, he's very engaged. He's actually working very closely with um, Vice President-elect Harris. And I am optimistic about um, what to expect in the next few years with this administration. I believe that there is a commitment and um, I, it's funny, but uh, when the election, I know it hasn't been officially called, but when we finally had an idea of who our next president would be, people rejoiced. And I had to be clear with them that the work is just beginning. <laughs> you know, it, the, you know it, the time for celebrating is not now. The time for what we, what, we, what we need to do now is roll up our sleeves to get engaged with the politics. We can't put the change that we require all on our elected officials. We have to be a part of the process. We have to be engaged in the process. And, um, and I think only through that engagement will we start to see the gains that we hope and that we expect from these politicians. So it's an interesting time. Uh, and it's certainly not a time or an opportunity to sit back and watch. This is when we need to be most engaged. And if we're going to talk about eradicating hate crimes. And if we're going to talk about eradicating discrimination, we're just starting at ground zero. We can't put all of this on Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, or any of our local elected officials. We have to be there in the trenches working. We have to be visible showing that this is something we're vested in and we're, we will follow through. So, um, you know, again, it's right now it's still kind of tenuous, but I think that what I what I would like to see moving forward is all the multitudes that we saw that took to the streets this summer uh, protesting racial injustice, that they're just engaged in the political process and the democratic process to promote those ideals that they were protesting for. Well, speaking of, of local uh, politics. I, that does a nice segue, Tamara, <laughs> into what I was going to uh, bring Curtis into this conversation about, because it's ser serving on the city council, um, I think that it's you have an important perspective here. And uh, there was a recent town hall where, uh, during the presidential campaign, where a young uh, uh, Black man asked President Biden or President-elect Biden uh, why he should even go vote, because nothing ever really changed. And uh, even though we've elected a, a black president, um, do you, as somebody who is involved, obviously, in the political system in a, a very active way, do you think that hope for uh, eradicating racism is in part through local um, service, political service? I'll have to break that up a little bit. <laughs> uh, to the first thing, which was the young um, person of color who asked uh, President-elect Biden if, uh, the importance of voting. Um, the number one thing I would say is at what point do we acknowledge the school system, our government classes failed our students? Our public school systems, institutions need to be instrumental and catalyst for change that happens with truly educating our, our younger generations and truly making sure that their curriculum doesn't speak to no child left behind that law that we have here because every single child is left behind when that pipeline leads to the judicial system or it leads to the wage disparities we have in America. So that's the first thing I would say is that uh, as a president elect that we failed you. There is absolutely no way as a person in America, regardless of color, you don't understand the importance of civic engagement or being involved. So that's that. Um, in terms of being a locally elected official, 
it literally makes all of the difference. The number one thing I said when I was running is one, I would be a fly city counselor. That, that was for sure. But two, I would change the narrative and the negative connotations that are associated with being an elected official. Far too often I have to correct people that say, well, you're a volunteer. No, I'm actually just underpaid. And two, I am elected. It takes a lot of work to be a city councilor. It's, it, it's not an easy thing. Um, so I make sure I correct them there. The other thing is, I'm all the difference of tax dollars. I'm, uh, it's a $150 million budget that I'm in, I, I oversee. I, I champion and I chair economic development. That's everything that's being built in your city. That is how we build this infrastructure. And then I'm very intentional with working with the administration on every time that we get new revenue, if everything remains status quo and we just stayed as is, we have that associated budget. So I wanna talk about what happens next with that added revenue, those added adjustments that come in. And we're gonna fill something that's called what I call the equity cup. And we're gonna do so in a very meaningful and intentional way. Um, but I'm one human. And if you remove me from this council or this equation, you miss out on that one human that could be instrumental in all these different things. Um, one of the big things I'm, I, I'm super huge about is connecting dots. So getting to work with um, uh, Tom, who we were speaking with earlier on, on um, the Black History Marker Tour, that all came from me during my campaign trail and um, Nicole uh, Thomas, who was my uh, finance, uh, finance director for my uh, campaign, her having me go to his presentation and something about hearing this black man who was a freed slave or, or who paid to, to not be a slave and at 81 years old, this man who just got his freedom did not stop believing, did not stop fighting and did not stop championing being the progression that's necessary. He got rejected by the Board of Ed for 50 bucks to pay him to go and educate black and brown students. It wasn't about money, it was about that he saw the need even after being a freed slave that he had to go and do something to make sure we change the trajectory um, and not only change the trajectory, that we have this pipeline that we're very intentional about. And I keep saying this keyword intentional because far too open, we do this little dance around Black Lives Matter and Black issues and racial discrimination. Um, and it can't be a dance, it has to be intentional. And as a Black young city counselor, I get to be very intentional and I get to be in all the conversations that say, hey, guess what? All those marginalized people that Colton was talking about, they are now relevant in city government. They're relevant in policy. They're relevant in taxes. They're relevant in decision-making. And that takes us being involved. So that's what I would say to that young black man that thinks his vote doesn't count or think that just voting in a presidential election and it's done. I would say, do you know who your mayor is? Do you know who your state rep is? Do you know who your senator is? Because if you're not involved, you're not heard. And if you're not heard, we can't get equity. Thanks. Yeah, I want, so before we do our wrap up, uh, Colton, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say I 100% echo everything Curtis has said. And I think that a part of that acknowledgement of failure is also understanding the intentionality of design. You don't know what you don't know, right? So as a young person, as an American citizen, we scream loud oh you gotta vote and we condemn people for not voting or not knowing you know uh, things about the issues but it's not even an embedded deeply in our curriculum so as a if we really believe so much that being an american and cit a citizen and being educated and informed is so important how come it's not given more focus right your average young person your average person an american doesn't actually even fully understand this the voting system or our uh, the, the so-called like right. bipartisan system right so i think another step forward is we need to start really looking at curriculum again because i would love it if in in um marginalized communities at a young age young people were really educated on how the system works and i think we would see more city councilors right but representation matters someone like curtis opens up a whole other pathway and a door for someone but we need to create what he's talking about pipelines the work the idea of pipelines is so important because it's that's the way that we funnel and that starts with education and understanding that we need to do the work there absolutely so uh we've come to getting towards the end of our program here tonight and as we look to wrap up with all of our panelists uh, in these last minutes uh, we're going to we've, we've already been reflecting on our path forward um, 
as Americans, can we reach full and true equality and integration and still maintain unique ethnic, regional, cultural, and religious identities as well? And are you hopeful for the future or are you worried? And so we're gonna call on each of you to give a kind of two minute um, wrap up here. And we're gonna start with, with Tom who, who opened for us to reflect uh, kind of on this, uh, on this issue, maybe from a historical perspective or maybe, uh, maybe not. But uh, Tom, can you give us your thoughts on this? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, first of all, I, I want to say I have appreciated everything that's been said before, and I want to give kudos to, to Tamara and to Colton and to Curtis for their input here tonight. It's been a learning experience for me. But yes, I think we, uh, at this point, the way forward, uh, we've got a long way to go. And yes, I'm worried, uh, but I am cautiously hopeful at the same time. This country was founded uh, on the principle that men are all, all men are created equal, and here we are 200 and 45 years later, still struggling to find a way to make those lofty words a reality. Uh, we just saw 72 million of our fellow Americans vote to keep the status quo or maybe even reverse that progress. We've seen an emboldening of those who espouse bigotry and racism. And as challenging as that is, uh, it's actually a, a, a good thing. Uh, those problems have always been there, bubbling below the surface. And now we see them in the light of day. So we've gotten an education in just how far we still need to go. How do we go forward? Uh, the word education has come up a lot tonight and, I, and I'm right there with it too. It starts with education, just as it did for Ichabod Pease. We need more programs like this one uh, with a broader reach for starters, okay? We need to find a way to reach the folks who are not in attendance tonight. And some of those folks are in our families, they're in our churches, they're in our social networks. And there are co-workers. Uh, my friend Lonnie Braxton reminds me, uh, just for an example, what's the most segregated day of the week? It's Sunday. <laughs> we need to think about that. Isn't that interesting? Uh, on an individual basis, I think we need to speak up and we need to speak out. We each have a role to play in this. For example, uh, as I see my role here in my twilight years. Uh, I wish to be an ally uh, helping provide some of that education uh, by uncovering and telling some of these hidden and forgotten stories about Ichabod Pease, Sarah Harris Fairweather, Sadie Dillon Harrison, Lindwood Bland, Lottie Scott, and the Green Book, and many more uh, to groups like this and in school classrooms. Uh, these stories provide examples and models for us to learn from and for our children to aspire to. On a broader level, I think we need to engage the legislators and the decision makers, and better yet, become those legislators and decision makers, like Curtis Goodwin uh, and other people of color, to help them address the structural systems that perpetuate the inequities in our society. And those inequities in are in housing, education, health care, justice, and wealth. Uh, and they're also intertwined, so much so that uh, many of us don't even recognize that they're there, unless you're a victim of it. A case in point is if we look at the disproportionate impact of the COVID-19 on black and brown people, or if we look at the criminal justice system, these answers defy easy solutions, but they are all connected. But this is work that needs to be done. A wiser man than I once said, if not us, who? If not now, when? Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, Curtis, do you want to uh, give your wrap up? Um, I, uh, Tom, thank you for that. I think you kind of gave my wrap up. Um, <laughs> it was also my campaign uh, slogan, if not now, when? And it was to remind people that there's no better time than now to, to champion progression and to do so. Um, I think the biggest thing um, I would like to echo is for all those that are participating, and I did see your questions, feel free to email me um, to get answer. It's a good point that there's still so much dialogue that needs to happen. This, this can't be the end of these conversations. We get too caught up in being reactive, and I need organizations, associations, and nonprofits to reach across the aisle and to go find that representation, to go find the Colton Harris's the Curtis Goodwins that are out there. We should not be tokens. We should not be unique examples who made it out of the hood per se. Um, there's others out there. 
And it takes mentoring. It takes deliberate and intentional partnerships. It takes equity in our school system. Um, and if we really want to bridge the divide and we really want to uh, put into the work, we have to do it on all fronts. I choose art as Colton does. I also choose being a politician and stepping up. But I ask all of you, what will you choose? And will you do so now? Because there are black kids that are dying, that are left behind, that are marginalized here presently today. And I think we all voted and said we are against marginalizing black and brown uh, kids and, and, and adults. We also said we're against racism in this country when we voted for the president elect. So what are we gonna do to be intentional about seeing that through? Uh, I'm more about seeing something through to the finish line and to the goal than it is being reactive and just being in the moment for Black Lives Matter. Um, because my life matters and I'm sure your life matters. And if we don't do something to change the trajectory, we're just gonna go in this repeat and in a circle. Um, and to Colton's point earlier, America is gonna be reflective of brown people. And that's just the reality. And it shouldn't be a threat, it's a beautiful thing. So I just ask each of you that are listening, um, what are you gonna to do to get involved? And how intentional are you going to be about being involved? As an institution, we all have platforms. And I question and caution you to use that to your advantage, to not just be an ally who sits in the corner. There's no longer being silent. There's no, uh, well, we work in corporate or our institution is, isn't allowed to put out a statement. No, there are lives at risk each and every day. It's not about a statement. I don't wanna see a statement, I want to see action. So I encourage all of you guys to be a part of action. I encourage you guys to reach across the aisle and I encourage you to just keep trying one foot in front of the other because we will get there if we truly have that vision and we see it through. Um, thank you guys all for putting this on and let's not, let's not let the dialogue or conversation stop here. Thank you so much, Curtis, that's, that's great. Um, I think we'll turn to tomorrow now What to, for your wrap up. I don't know what else I can say that <laughs> hasn't already been said, um, but you know, in terms of a wrap up, I think you know, what resonates with me is moving forward and being engaged. And I think about the, 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 the term silence is complicity. And I know that there are so many good people not only here in Connecticut, but across this country that care about the, the, not only the trajectory of where we're going as a nation, but care about people as a whole, that care about children and want to do more to help. And so what I would encourage people is to get associated. There are too many organizations locally here that you can be affiliated with where you can make a difference. You can join the NAACP, you can join, I mean, the, New London is, is filled with different organizations and not only organizations, but churches. There is a place for you to get involved and to make this community a better place. Um, I, I say that also to suggest that um, if, if we see something that we know is improper, that is wrong, and we don't do anything to either correct it or to expose it, then we just have to own that we're a part of the problem. And that's where I think, um, you know, I get disappointed in our community because when I look at, you know, as I traveled around Connecticut this, pla this past election cycle, I saw what I felt were too many Trump supporters and Trump signs. I'm like, is mm -hmm. this Connecticut? But yes, it is. But what happens is, the silence of good people actually is encouraging the bad people. And, and sometimes pointing out that bad behavior might, where we might not change hearts, we may change behaviors. And I think um, if we just model the, the type of citizen we should be, we may be able to either expose someone to something they need to see or encourage someone to be something other than what they are. Um, so I'm just saying that this is a time of responsibility. It's a time for people to be engaged. It's a time for people to model good behavior and respect. Um, and I often think about a quote that Martin Luther King celebrate is that darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And uh, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. We, we have to be more about loving each other and respecting each other and lifting each other up 
and being our brothers and sisters keepers and just modeling that. And those that do not embrace that in this moment may eventually come around. So that's my hope. Well, we, we're right there with you tomorrow. I, mm -hmm. I think all of us are. Mm -hmm. And, and fi finally, uh, Colton. Yeah, thank, thank you again for this platform and this opportunity. I stand behind all of what was said. So what I'm gonna say is not gonna reiterate that. I really wanted to just introduce something is that we've all been alluding to it, but all of this work really takes proximity and relationship building. So if you were someone who wants to get engaged with the work, you have to start with building relationships and there are really simple and practical ways to do that. There's in your political affiliation doesn't do the work for you. It's about who do you know, where do you live, where do you occupy your time, what stores do you shop at, how many black people do you have intimate proximity with, right? I think that that's the way that we learn and grow. So I, I encourage people even on a practical level, find ways to build relationships. And I'm I, some a phrase that I always say is I know that people talk about wanting to have seats at the table. I'm actually a proponent of destroying the existing table and building new ones because what we build together is what will last. And it's not about inviting marginalized people to oppressive structures. It's about undo, undoing and dismantling the structures and building a new culture. And in that way, we all win because I think people feel threatened when we hear about dismantling or being against racism, you're not losing, you're actually gonna experience a more fruitful and flourishing life. Like, what would the world look like if one of your kids, their godparent was a, a black person or an Asian, an Asian person, or you know, your wedding party is so eclectic and vibrant because to your question, the, the beauty of, of our struggle and the beauty of our goal is that we're, we're just trying to get rid of the supremacy we want to keep the beauty of all the different cultures in the way that they can mix and mesh and it create a new kind of beauty together. And so that's what the goal is. So my hope is centered in that, but my hope ultimately is not in this country and it's not in the people running this country. My hope is in believing that there is a God who's sovereign over all things and that together we can really push these agendas forward. And will we see it in our lifetime? I'm not sure, but uh, there's always reason for hope. Well, thank you so much to all our panelists, uh, Curtis, Colton, Tamara, and Tom. And again, I am so honored that I could uh, be a part of this important conversation tonight. Uh, and I hope certainly as do all our panelists that this continues to, to go. Uh, thank you to uh, the LaGrua Center and to the Jewish Federation of Eastern Connecticut. And I'm gonna turn this over now back to Jerry, who I think there might be a few minutes if we have some questions from our audience. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, before I get to the questions, I wanna say something that I feel very strongly about. And that is that our encountering programs, which gave birth to this exhibit are exactly about coming to the table the whole beauty of the encountering programs are people walking into African-American homes or Jewish homes and sitting in their living room and dining room and hearing those stories. Um, the first question really goes to Colton, um, but everybody else can address it. In a way, it goes to all of you. And that is um, the idea that art is the way we come together. Um, and people have reflected and texted me and called while we were talking about things like white musicians in Chicago going to learn jazz, which is an African-American art form, by walking into black clubs and sitting down and playing. And Benny Goodman bringing black musicians into his band to integrate uh, his band. Um, sports, I know it's often too um, stereotypical, but the NBA in their virtual season was so much about Black Lives Matter and 
um, the black athletes that make the NBA what it is were so outspoken. So I'd like you, Colton, to reflect on music, on sports, and maybe on the idea that a Hispanic, Lynn manuel Miranda, used hip hop and rap to create one of the greatest musical works, Hamilton, in our history. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll be as brief as possible. I think that, you know, even what you started to bring up alludes to it. I think that it, in the different industries, there are still a lot of systemic issues and a lot of racism, but, you know, at, in the music industry, but specifically music as an art form is probably the space where we see the most healing and the most, there's the most tools that we can use to show the eclectic nature of bringing musicians together, right? Quincy Jones and Frank Sinatra, like the, them being really, really tight and close because music breaks boundaries and in the midst of the racial, racial struck, uh, struggles. But like, as I said, especially music, I mean, think about some of your favorite artists and musicians and bands of all time. They've been able to travel all over the world and be able to connect with different groups of people. And at least for those moments, there was not a care or concern in the world, but it wasn't a means of escapism. It was teaching people how to live together and enjoy life. And so I think that whether it's that or like you pointed out the NBA and I'm a big NBA fan. I mean, sports are a little more problematic for me just because of the sort of <laughs> structural inequalities and inequities there. And it has a little, it alludes a little too much to slavery for me sometimes, but um, I won't comment too deeply on that. But as I just wanted to reiterate, I think art is a, is a great space, but music specifically, because I think that's where you have a lot of boundaries cross and in film and acting and stuff. There's, there's a lot of racist stuff that messes up our people but I think music is a good place to look. Um, Curtis, there was a question um, about corporate America supporting the education that would be required to fill the pipeline that can get students into positions in corporate America. And do you really think corporate America is willing to invest in the education necessary to create those pathways and have people walk through them? Uh, well, multiple different things there. So the first thing is uh, corporate America doesn't have a choice when you when you equate all the dollars spent by the black community. We're talking billions and trillions of dollars. If we redirect that spending elsewhere, corporate America doesn't get a choice in this conversation. Uh, we get to change the trajectory and the narrative there. Um, but in my conversations with corporate America, it all depends on the chief executive office officer at these different companies. There are certain companies that, you know, I'm thrilled to work with because they truly get it. They truly embody what it means to have an inclusive workforce and their spending and their procedures and their policy and their company culture. And then there's those companies that look at it as a check the box type of thing. And those are the folks that I'm really looking to get their attention to really change that. Um, I what was it two years ago I, I was in the stock exchange i got to ring the bell in the stock exchange the, the the black kid from public school system in new london was ringing the bell with all of my clients at eight all my partners rather at the hbcus which is another um uh client of mine's i represent all of the national uh black uh black associations here um in doing so we ring the bell and hp was the champion of that they had a woman there who really valued it and pulled some strings and made sure that these HBCUs, myself included, and all of my partners were able to ring the bell at the stock exchange, talk about life-changing experiences. So when we do stuff in a meaningful way and we truly embody the work and plan to actually do the work, change happens. And I'm starting to see it in corporate America. But at the end of the day, we as individuals and as a collective of black and brown people have to hold ourselves accountable so that we change the trajectory because, you know, we, we can, if we impact corporate America's pockets, they listen. Okay. Uh, the last question um, I'm going to pose to Tamara, even though she's not the uh, politician here. Um, Tamara, 40% of Connecticut voted for Donald Trump. And um, somebody wrote that you talked about, we have to respect the other side and we have to work with them. How do we deal with the fact that 40% of Connecticut voted for Donald Trump? Um, well, that's a sad commentary for Connecticut and it's also a sad reality 
Um, and and as I spoke to, um, I'm not sure the question earlier, but I think it's important. And I I think irrespective of how they feel, what their particular view is, there is a need to be respectful of each other. And also the fact that, um, you know, my constitutional and civil rights are equally as valued as anyone else's. And that when you bridge that or when you cross that, there has to be accountability. Um, I, I would be concerned that, you know, one of the, one of the, 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 the issues that I think that resulted in such support for Donald Trump um, this past uh, election cycle was um, a lot of misinformation, a lot of fear mongering, fear mongering, and a lot of falsely created narratives. And I think one of the things that we should do in terms of trying to bridge that divide and to engage in some healing is to correct those myths that have been put out there about people of color, about black and brown people. Um, uh, you know, the economic issues, uh, the, the, the immigration issues, and the fear mongering that has been associated um, with the identity politics. A lot of that is misleading. It's intentionally wrong to, to divide us. And so what we have to do, not only in terms of what we see on social media and the false narratives we see either on TV or in the news, is we have to make a concerted effort to correct that. And, and so that people are not making decisions based on fear and, and, and propaganda that's designed to divide us. I, I, I truly believe that there are so many um, people out there. There was uh, in the last months of the campaign, this, this suburban fear about their coming and they're moving into our neighborhoods. Uh, so we have to have honest discussions about what that was and how that made people feel and why. Um, and to understand that I'm no threat to you because I choose to move into a house that's associated with you or your community. And uh, so there is a lot of dialogue that needs to happen to undo some of the harm that's caused. But there's a reality out there that some people are, are, are just, um, um, you know, some people operate under their bias and uh, that they um, have hate in their heart and they're not gonna change. And to those people I say, don't encroach on my rights and I won't encroach on yours. Um, but I do believe that there is room for discussion about all of the false narratives that were sent about people of color and to do some teaching and education on, you know, just, just um, uh, uh, community and what community means and it doesn't have to mean that uh, you should be afraid of me because I'm not like you. Okay. And I'm going to jump in here, Jerry, because we're please. to a conclusion. Jerry, we're past our time. Thank but you all very much for participating this evening and I'm handing it over to Laurie. Yes, and I want to bring back on Colton and Gail and Tom so we can all look at you and, and thank you. I'm sorry we don't have little applause emojis, but we'll, we'll do that one. Um, but the dialogue will continue. I want to remind people that we actually are going to have a third panel on Wednesday, December 2nd at 6 p.m. about how the faith community responds to racism. I think somebody brought up uh, the idea of the, the, the Sunday <laughs> divide mm -hmm. in our country. We'll see what some of our leaders who uh, celebrate on Sundays we'll talk about as well as those of Saturdays. Um, also, you can go, uh, you can go to Lagura Center, our, our website to sign up for that one. And, and please know that our exhibit will still be up um, through the middle of December. And we're open on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And cool. except for the Thanksgiving Day holiday. And if that doesn't work in your schedule, please call us and we'll try to arrange another time. But uh, chiefly as we go, thank you, Gail, for stellarly steering the ship uh, through this tonight. And for our four panelists, we are so grateful to you for your candor and your generosity of spirit. We have much to do. Um, and this discussion is a small step to, to move us forward. So we're very grateful to you. We're grateful to you in the audience for sticking with us. Thank you also very much. Good night.